David Brewster here from the Brewster's Millions of Rants, and this is Stick It In Your Ear, and this is an ear training uh, lesson or rant. And I've had some requests about this, but I've also had requests from students for years or decades uh, about ear training, you know, learning music by ear, being able to hear music and kind of quickly figure out what it is. And this extends from like licks and melodies and phrases to being able to hear, you know, different types of chords, you know, just by listening to it. And this is hard. And I'll, I'll fully admit, um, you know, I've had a lot of ear training in my experience as a musician, um, whether it was in college and it was actually a class. Uh, you know, I had a sight singing class back in college and that was really hard where we had books, you know, and... and the tests would basically be the instructor, you know, hitting the first note on a piano. And you had literally, you know, just like a partial uh, idea of what you were supposed to sing. And you literally had to take that first note that they played, look at the sheet music, and you literally had to sight sing, you know, off the sheet music, which that was really hard. Um, but I was able to do it. I passed the class. But uh, this is really difficult, and this is an area that scares a lot of people away, especially guitarists, and um, because you're doing something a lot different than you normally are. Um, you know, we're not going to focus on shredding or any crazy licks or anything like that. We're literally going to fine-tune your ear, and after you work on some of this material, and you definitely need to work on this, you know, on your own, too. I mean, just watching this video isn't uh, isn't going to magically bless you with a great ear. You have to literally practice it. As far as the subject of ear training is concerned, I have seen a few videos on YouTube where they were somewhat recent and they were from, uh, you know, content creators and they were telling people not to do what I'm about to show you. And I highly argue with that point of view. I don't really know where they're coming from. If those people that made those videos actually went to music school or they had you know, music theory classes or any actual like real world knowledge as far as learning this, uh, they would realize that this is really important. This is crucial. Um, but so many people just skip right over it because it seems too easy or too basic or they don't really see what they're supposed to be learning, you know. Um, and it's hard, especially for guitarists. Guitarists are you know, short attention span, they hear a cool lick or they see a, you know, a shiny guitar and they start drooling and they lose their mind and they lose their focus. Um, so you have to, you know, kind of be focused on the prize. You know, if you want to improve your ear and, you know, hear music differently, um, learn music differently, um, this is where it's at. You have to start, you know, kind of at the building blocks and then it's almost like you're building a house. You know, you build the foundation and then you put the walls up and the roof and you paint it and whatever. And the next thing you know, there's a house there. But uh, you have to start somewhere. And this is the best place to start. We're going to be talking about intervals. And we're going to be talking about the chromatic scale loosely. Um, and we have talked about this, you know, in uh, some of the chord construction, chord play episodes. Uh, you know, the uh, chromatic connection, you know, from scales and tails. And little bits of this have popped up in other lessons and other videos so far. But we're going to attack this kind of head on and we're really uh, going to shed some light on you know, the differences between the intervals. And by learning this, you're going to definitely improve your ear, but you'll also understand, you know, chords and scales and, uh, you know, some of the things that change, you know, when you just listen to music and you hear a note go higher or a note go lower or a note within a chord changing. So I put this in the key of C and, uh, you know, if you've watched some of my other material, I really don't like always referring to the key of C major or A minor, um, you know, for things like this, but in certain situations, it really is the best place to start, you know, like as far as a starting point. And um, I've talked about this, you know, in other videos too, where it's like, well, I'm regrettably putting this in C major, you know, and it's just basically because it's always shown in those keys. And uh, I like to mix things up, you know, which is why I typically would put things into other keys, um, but we're going to lock into C and we're technically going to use like a C chromatic scale. All right, everything in the kitchen sink, right? C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C. Now those notes I just identified, 
could technically uh, be named other pitches or other notes. You know, C, you know, that could be a C sharp. It can also be a D flat. There's D. This could be a D sharp or an E flat. There's E, there's F. That can be F sharp or G flat. There's G, the G sharp or A flat. There's A sharp or B flat. So it's a little confusing because a few of those notes have two different names, you know, like this one, you know, that can be C sharp or D flat. And it really depends on what you're playing, what key you're in, what you're doing within that key. Um, you know, the key signature actually dictates a lot of that. Um, but for this, um, we're just going to kind of step through uh, the different intervals and we're really going to talk about, you know, what they sound like, where you can hear it, a way for you to kind of identify the sound with just your ear. And uh, the more you practice this, and like in the beginning, your progress is going to be kind of slow because you're getting used to hearing these pitches and intervals in different ways. But uh, in a little bit of time, with a little bit of practice, your ear is going to get really, you know, sharp or really smart. And you'll hear music on the radio or maybe you'll be at a restaurant or at a mall or whatever and you'll hear music and your ear will say, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, there's an octave. You know, like you'll start hearing this everywhere you go. Turn the TV on and your ear will start hearing intervals, you know, whether they're sung or played on guitar or piano or cello or kazoo or whatever. Um, your ear is going to definitely, you know, kind of get smarter. The first interval we're going to look at is actually a unison or what they call a perfect unison. And uh, that's when you basically just repeat the same note and it doesn't go up or down anywhere. Um, you know, so in the key of C, that would just be two C's. You know, like whatever octave you're gonna play them in. And you know, on a piano, they would just hit the same key twice. Now on the guitar, we can actually play unisons, you know, fretted. You have to really stretch for them, but you can find them. You know, you can actually sound, you know, two strings and you can sustain that unison, which is pretty cool. And then, of course, you can find this in melodies and stuff, too. You know, take like a Twinkle Twinkle a Little Star. You know, the first two notes is a unison. Right, just that double C. Or other famous, you know, melodies. Uh, God Save the Queen or My Country Tis of Thee. Right, those first two notes are, are doubled. But then think of, you know, like classic, you know, rock and blues and, and guitar music. You know, think of Pride and Joy by uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. But right there in that little slide in the beginning, that's a unison. Because you're hearing, you know, two of the exact same pitch and the exact same note at the exact same time. Up next, we're gonna look at seconds, and we're gonna have a minor second and also a major second. Now, uh, this area of, uh, you know, note identification or, you know, interval identification can get a little confusing. Um, so we're gonna lock in to having a C root. So we're not gonna talk about C sharp. We're gonna refer to this note as D flat because we want that minor second or that flat nine uh, reference. So we're not going to change our starting note. We're locking in the C and then we're going to identify that as a D flat instead of C sharp. So there's a reason why we're kind of clamping down on notes like that. But this is just a half step, right? You know, like C to D flat. You know, depending on what octave you want to put that in. Um, and the most common or most famous, you know, theme for minor seconds, uh, which this registers for almost everybody. You know, the theme from Jaws, you know, it's just a half step. So I'm gonna change the key of Jaws to fit, you know, the key of C here. But just think of, you know, that C going up a half step. Right, think of Jaws. And you could think of other things too, like the theme from the Pink Panther. seconds, you know, kind of moving around. Um, joy to the world. You know, that beginning, that's 
basically a, a minor second descending. You know, going down a half step. Um, and then the other side of the coin there would be major seconds, um, or a whole step. And that would be C moving to D. You know, and think of something like the beginning of Happy Birthday. Right? It's just, a, it's a whole step or a major second. And you can also think of this, you know, as far as chords moving as well. Um, you're just kind of recognizing the sound of this. And there are tons of melodies and famous riffs. You know, think of Silent Night, you know, the Christmas song. There's a, a whole step or a major second right there. Or you can think of rock riffs, you know, think of uh, Crossroads by Cream. And right there you can hear Clapton, you know, playing an A root, then he plays an A an octave higher, and then it goes down, you know, a whole step or a major second. So once your ear gets used to the way that sounds and the way, you know, seconds kind of interact or react to each other, um, you'll start hearing it. Like you'll, you'll hear the Pink Panther um, and that's a minor second. Or maybe you'll hear Happy Birthday or something and that's a major second. And then to clean up any confusion there might be about seconds and nights, um, you know, when you're identifying chords or maybe you're spelling an arpeggio, a second is also known as a ninth. And this is just a good rule of thumb. Um, there are exceptions, you know, especially with music theory, it seems there's always an exception or multiple exceptions. But if you're playing, you know, a basic, just major chord or major triad, and you add the second, then you're typically going to refer to that as a second, like a sus two or an add to something like that. Um, but then if the chord you're playing has a seventh, then you're typically going to use the ninth name instead. And like I said, that's just a general rule of thumb. There are some exceptions, but that's a pretty good rule of thumb to kind of keep in mind. You know, if you're playing something, you know, built around seventh chords, you're going to call it a ninth. But if you're just dealing with like a basic triad or a basic major or minor chord, you're going to refer to it as a second. And up next we have thirds. So we're going to have a minor third and then also a major third. And the third's really important, especially when you're building chords or arpeggios because the third dictates whether what you're playing is minor or if it's major. So the third is pretty powerful. You know, one note controls, you know, that happy or sad uh, kind of tonality shift. So for um, minor thirds, we're gonna basically play a C and then an E flat. <laughs> of course um, and right there you can think there's a ton of stuff you can think of um, think of the riff to uh, seven nation army by the white stripes right you can kind of hear that jump or that raise in the notes a minor third again like in a chord you're gonna hear say like this you know C minor chord and right there with your middle finger there's that E flat and you can definitely kind of hear that minor sound where you can hear, you know, minor thirds in action. Think of the Star Spangled Banner. You know, the first two notes, uh, C to A, that's a descending minor third. You kind of see, you know, that minor third in action right there. Um, and if you're a Beverly Hills Cop fan or Eddie Murphy fan, think of Axel F, you know, like the theme from uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Kind of hear that's uh, you know a C up to an E flat. Now as far as major thirds, um, that's going to be where we're moving from C up to an E. Okay, a little different ring to it. A couple different ways you can play it, of course. 
Um, but you know, with those major thirds, think of uh, like Beethoven's fifth. That is a descending major third. You know, or think of uh, you know rock songs like uh, "Blister in the Sun" by the Violent Femmes. You know, in the beginning. And that's a major third. You know, if we transpose that to the key of C, uh, we could do the same riff. And right there you can see, you know, it's a C to an E. It's a major third. Next is a perfect fourth. And fourths are also called elevenths. Um, so with a perfect fourth, or, or just a fourth interval, um, that would be known as an eleventh. And, uh, this is a very common, you know, intervallic, uh, you know, sound or whatever. You can hear it in melodies, you can hear it in guitar riffs, and a ton of different places. But that would be a C to an F. And the first thing I hear in my head when I hear that is, here comes the bride. That's very obvious. You know, very distinct sound. You could also think of, like, Luke's theme from Star Wars. You could think of, you know, tons of stuff. The melody from Amazing Grace. You know, right there in the beginning, that's a perfect fourth. You could also think of Einklein Nacht music, or a little night music from Mozart. catching this sound. You could hear that as a fourth, you know, like strum like a chord. Or you could hear it separated, you know, like part of the melody or a lick or a phrase. Up next we have the augmented fourth, which is also known as the diminished fifth. So this would be the sharp four or flat five, uh, depending on, you know, what key you're in and what you're actually playing. Uh, that'll dictate, you know, which name you're going to give this. Um, so for right now, we're just going to call it a raised fourth or a sharp four. But keep in mind that could also be, you know, the flat five, like what's in the blues scale. You know, that dreaded, you know, flat five. Um, but, you know, you can think of a lot of things. Think of the, like the intro to The Simpsons. The Simpsons. You can kind of hear that's a tritone or a, you know, a flat five or a sharp four, depending on which way you want to think of it. I feel like musicals and, and Broadway shows, um, you know, think of West Side Story, like Maria. But if you're a prog rock nerd like me, think of YYZ by Rush on the intro. Um, you know, that's basically a you know a flat five or a sharp four descending. You know that C note down to either F sharp or G flat. You know depending on where you're using it. But that's definitely the scary monster sound that you hear in a lot of classical and metal and you know different styles of music, jazz. You know very tense and dark, but it's extremely popular and really useful too. Next is the perfect fifth, and most of you uh, you know they're familiar with power chords. Just think of this basically like a power chord. All right, it's just a C to a G, which is a perfect fifth or a power chord. But you can hear this in tons of music. You know, think of the theme from Star Wars. There's tons of stuff you can think of that uses this. And technically, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star again. You know, those first two notes right there. That's a perfect fifth. Now, if you're a cartoon nerd like me, uh, think of the Flintstones. In those first two notes, that's a descending fifth. You know, a C all the way down to that F right there. And up next is a minor sixth. And, uh, you know, if we were thinking of chords or arpeggios, you could call this a flat six or also a flat thirteen. Uh, it just depends on what key you're in and what you're actually playing as far as, you know, how you'll actually identify or name this note. Um, but this would be a C to an A flat, technically. Now, 
also, uh, you know, we've kind of uncovered this in a few episodes of chord play too. That note could also be thought of as implying um, augmented, you know, because an augmented chord has a raised fifth or a sharp five. So the flat six and sharp five are the same note. Um, they just have a different name, you know. Uh, it could be G sharp or it could be A flat. Um, for this instance, you know, what we're doing right now with intervals, let's think of that as an A flat. Let's not really worry about the augmented side. It exists, um, and it's important to know it's there. But let's focus on these minor sixth, you know, intervals. So there's a ton of songs uh, that you can you kind of find these sixth being used. Um, once again, another show tune, you know, think of uh, Love Story, you know, Colt Porter. And you can kind of hear that interval of a sixth right there. Another famous melody that has this minor sixth, uh, you know, think of The Entertainer by Scott Joplin. And you can kind of see right there that E to C. is a minor sixth right there. Um, right up next is the major sixth, which you can think of this as a sixth, or you can also think of it as the thirteenth. It just depends on what you're playing, what key you're in, you know, what chord or arpeggio you're playing. Um, but for these sixths, we're just going to move from C now to A. And that's kind of the sound. Now, uh, like the NBC theme peacock theme or whatever. Um, you could th see that on 30 Rock a lot. Uh, I love Tina Fey. But uh, anyway, you know, that's, that's one place definitely very recognizable. Uh, my Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, like the old, you know, kind of sailor song or whatever. Right? And you can kind of hear that sixth in there. Truth be told, when I hear sixth, uh, especially if they're played on guitar, and if they're in a certain, you know, key or a certain pitch, if they're really low, I don't really hear it this way. But I always think of Steve Cropper, you know, like Soul Man. Um, and those are major sixths. all over the place, uh, you know, country licks and a whole bunch of stuff. Right up next is a minor seventh, and uh, these definitely make an appearance, you know, uh, minor seventh chords, uh, dominant seventh chords, uh, minor seven flat five chords, and a lot of other chords too, and arpeggios. Um, but this would be a C to a B flat. And my ear is just trained, uh, you know, as soon as I hear that, I think of the old theme from Star Trek. Jump in the, the melody right there is a minor seventh. The one that I always think of is uh, Josie by Steely Dan. Right, those first two notes. You know, that's a, a minor seventh. You know, very tense and dark, but sometimes when I hear that interval, you know, like maybe a vocalist, you know, sung it or a saxophone or a guitar or whatever. Sometimes my ear will hear Steely Dan where it's like, oh, I think I know what that is. Next is a major seventh, and this of course is, uh, you know, going to appear in major seventh chords, and we're going to be playing, you know, a C to a B. Just very tense and very, you know, dissonant, um, but you can definitely hear it, you know, like a major seventh chord. You can hear it a bunch of places, and in a chord, you don't really hear how dark and tense that interval is. But when you just play it by itself, it's like, whoa, that's really ugly. You know, it's very tense. There's a few, you know, melodies and songs you could use that, that you know, target this interval. Um, but one of the best ones I've found is uh, the 80s song, you know, Take On Me by AHA. Um, it's the vocal, like the chorus or whatever. Take on me. That's basically, you know, a major seventh, um, and then it turns into the octave. That's literally uh, what the vocalist sings in that famous song. And you could also think of Robert Plant's vocal part in the Immigrant Song, which uh, it's not going to sound right, you know, in the key of C. 
when you hear Robert Plant, you know, sing his melody, uh, that uh, that dip, it's dipping down to the major seven. He's kind of, you know, toying with the octave. Finally, we're at the octave where we're going to basically play, you know, two C notes an octave apart. And there's a lot of things you can think of, you know, regarding this. You know, think of somewhere over the rainbow. You know, it's a very common place to hear that. Um, My Sharona by the Knack. Um, but I always think of that. And we were talking about Immigrant Song a minute ago from Led Zeppelin. Right there, there's an octave. everywhere. So this lesson really just kind of walked through each interval. You know, I kind of talked about it briefly. I demonstrated a melody or a phrase or two. Um, but what you want to do as far as practicing this is you don't want to practice this the way I just did it. Like you don't want to just run through it all and think, oh, I worked on ear training. Cool. I'm going to move on to sweeps. It's like, no, this is something you're going to sit there and you're going to play, you know, like maybe, maybe a melody or a phrase or you know, maybe it's a recording of something or you could bring up a video or something on YouTube and you literally want to connect whatever you're listening to or attempting to play or physically playing with your ear. You want to connect those two things and you really want your brain and your ear to hear what you just heard or what you just played and identify what it is, you know, and you can do this. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can attack and approach this. Um, you can simply just turn on a radio and listen to what's coming out of the radio, grab your guitar, and attempt to follow along, like listen for the pitch. Like, did it go up? Did it go down? How far did it go up or down? You know, did it go up a third? Did it go down a fourth? Did it go up a fifth or, or whatever? And when you hear music do this, that's literally what's happening. Like, it's changing intervals. It's moving from one note to another. And by working on intervals like this and really getting used to the way they sound and associating the way they sound with, you know, famous music and famous songs, you'll hear it a lot faster. You know, if you didn't have the song reference, they might not really sound, you know, like separate or like, like different things. But, um, you know, for a lot of people, the easy ones are, are the ones you probably, you know, want to target and nail those down first. You know, start listening for fourths and fifths and octaves. And then you can start getting into like seconds and sixths and things like that. But um, I know for me initially, every time, you know, I heard a fourth, you know, I could just hear it. It just sounded like Mozart or Here Comes the Bride and it popped out. You know, as soon as somebody played it or sang it or whatever, I could hear it. And it was like, hey, I know what that is. You know, and the same thing with fifths. You know, I kind of grew up like a Star Wars kid. So, I mean, I'm very familiar with the theme and the music from Star Wars. But as soon as I associated that... As soon as I asso you know, associated that fifth with Star Wars, that's all my ear could hear. You know, it's like, hey, I think they just played a perfect fifth. Because that's what my ear heard. And, um, so this process is, like, it's an ongoing thing. It's something you're going to work and kind of fine-tune and craft. For years you know this isn't something you're gonna do like in a weekend or a month or two like this is literally something it's almost like you're you're growing a garden or something and you have to be patient and slowly you know kind of tend your your listening garden I guess your sound garden um, but anyway um, this is really important but it's also kind of boring it's not exciting you know it's not like sitting down and learning how to play little dreamer or crazy train or something or whatever it's like okay you know i gotta sit there with my guitar and i gotta kind of sweat it out and i really have to listen and think and you have to go slow you know slow and steady definitely wins this race because you don't want to speed through this because if you go too fast you're not going to gain or learn anything like your ear won't have time to associate it with anything and um uh, and you'll just kind of be stuck listening to music and reacting and learning music the same way. But I can guarantee this, if you try this and you start working on intervals and identifying these sounds and the pitches and uh, you know things like that, I guarantee it'll change the way you learn and listen and hear music. 
And whether it's on the radio or it's live or it's on TV or on the computer or on your phone or whatever, it's going to change the way you, you know, listen and interact with music big time. So leave some feedback and some comments. Please subscribe to Late Night Lessons, and I'll be back with part two of this very soon. Thank you.